Just ten years ago now, I was in the dressing room, rather like this one, preparing for one of the best experiences of my career, the first production of Martin Sherman's play, Bent. Since then, that play has gone right across the world, illuminating people's ignorance about the persecution of homosexuals in Nazi Germany. Prejudice and discrimination against them led to concentration camps and murder, mirroring the experience of other victims of the Third Reich. And I'm reminded that our own dear Section 28 is just the sort of legislation that one day a repressive government might decide to use against an unpopular minority of whom the rest of society is generally thoroughly ignorant. And like straight society, history too is ignorant of homosexuality. Well, tonight's film is a corrective. It places Nazi repression in a historical context. It does so without melodramatic or shocking pictures. I'm heartened by the sturdiness of the survivors. Their witness is full of vitality, and I think optimism too, because they encourage lesbians and gay men to be strong in our own self-defense, and encourage the rest of society to be appalled about what can be achieved in your name if you remain ignorant of homosexuality. Germany was the country where, in fact, the, the gay movement originated already at the end of the 19th century. And from the beginning, you had, uh, it was not one movement, but in Germany, you had uh, several movements. And there were especially two groups were very important. The first group was uh, the one led by the, the famous sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld. And he made use of the medical theories about homosexuality being a minority and a, an innate uh, characteristic of certain persons, he made use of those medical theories to promote the rights of homosexuals, to promote equal rights between homosexuals and heterosexuals. But next to this movement of Hirschfeld, you had another movement, which is called the Gemeinschaft der Eigenen, which you could translate by community of the special. This group of, of the Gemeinschaft der Eigenen rejected those medical theories which Hirschfeld used for his emancipation movement. the aesthetics of the body was very important for this movement. And in that case, the, the, the movement was, in fact, very typical in that time for a, a very a bigger movement in Germany. And I am thinking about the reform movement in Germany at that time, which wanted to go back to nature. It was very much a movement against the modernization of Germany at that time, industrialization, the big city. They wanted to go back to unspoiled nature. And you see this movement very clearly also in the Freikörper Kultur, the nudist movement, which originated, in fact, in the same time. refer to nature, but they never meant sex or sexuality with it. So this gymnastic teacher, for example, when he was photographed, he laid himself down and uh, put his genitals between his legs, uh, you know, like this, <laughs> like this, shown his muscles, but no sex because of the, <laughs> of course, that was, that was not really what they meant with nature. So they always meant the relationship between nature and culture, which was opposed to civilization. 
And in civilization, the body was perverted, because in civilization, body meant prostitution, uh, homosexuality, um, abortion, uh, all kinds of uh, things which they thought were sexual and were uh, pervert perverted. So um, this image of uh, the naked body was worshipped. It was worshipped in the youth movement uh, by boys and, g and girls. But of course there was a, a, a difference between uh, male body culture and uh, female body culture. Of course also the girls were naked and they liked, they worshipped the sun and they worshipped the wholeness, even the same, the same idea. They always were uh, photographed uh, near the water. Not the flowing water, not the river, because the river, the flowing water, was a male symbol but uh, near a lake, which meant the round, enclosed, silent, secret, fertile place where something could be born, born again. So you see that this body culture referred also to symbols of femininity and masculinity. They were very much afraid that female characteristics could come into a male body and male characteristics into a female body. Because if this happened, then in a way you were lost between the sexes. There was no clear order anymore. Uh, the wholeness was shattered. There was fragmentation. talked about the Gemeinschaft der Eigene is so interesting because in fact it made use of typical German tradition and that was the tradition of friendship which originated in the 18th century. They made use of the idea of friendship as being an emotional bond between men which was uh, glorified already then by literary men. And they also made use of the other concept of friendship, uh, friendship having a, a political nature, being of, of very important for the nation. And uh, in a certain way, they used these ideas to make homoeroticism, you could say, respectable and attractive, not only for a homosexual minority, but in fact for more men, to promote homoerotic relations between men in general. And for them, this was also uh, a going back to the Greek ideal of Greek male eros. And also, they made use of these very typical German traditions. started to organize themselves in settlements. Because the idea of Eros was linked to nature, these were settlements where nature could be worshipped. They organized body culture and gymnastics in these settlements, and they worked the land. Some of these settlements were called dance farms. When girls were talking about girls and the relationship they should have to each other, they were referring to an image of Eros. For example, this morning I was sitting at a lake and uh, the other girls were swimming and they were swimming naked and I looked at their bodies in the water. The sun was just coming up and it was such a wonderful, beautiful vision it was also a very lustful vision. So these kind of words they used to describe their relationship. Also, they touched each other and that they slept together. 
but what happened during the nights, it was never referred to. They described well-known elder pairs of women, that they had their separate room and they had their beds pulled together and they slept there. But it was not seen as, um, for example, it was not seen as a lesbian relationship. Uh, living together all the time, uh, sleeping together, touching each other, loving each other, was not seen as, as lesbian and it was not seen as sexuality in their sense of what sexuality could be. I mean, for us, it's completely different. We talk in different terms about these kind of relationships. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you could say this, this was female eros. sexologists were even concerned with the biology of women or women's sexual satisfaction I think is already an indication of the changing condition of women in Germany after the First World War of women who were working more outside of the home were more visible on the streets were having fewer children more abortions uh, asking for birth control more and, and causing uh, a generalized anxiety among politicians demographers even old feminists who wondered what was happening to this new generation of women. And I, I think that for sexologists in particular, they saw female sexuality with a kind of double vision, that on the one hand, they saw it as being very fragile, very vulnerable, uh, as expressing a kind of biological tragedy of women who had to be treated very carefully uh, so as not to be scared off uh, from heterosexuality. On the other hand, they perceived female sexuality, particularly that of a more independent wage earning women as being very potent, as being insatiable, uh, dangerous, needing to be channeled and controlled. And given that they believed that men and women were so fundamentally different socially and sexually, the task of creating this um, heterosexual uh, intimacy was rather daunting and uh, in many ways uh, was approached as, as, a, as a process not very different from the kind of rationalization process that was just becoming so widespread in industry. So we see almost a kind of extension of the principles of the assembly line uh, reproducibility, precision, discipline, the proper tempo, the proper hand motions, all producing the proper predetermined product, extending those principles into the bedroom. <laughs>
Paragraph 175 was the paragraph against homosexuality and which made homosexuals criminals and they could be put and would be put into prison. And that was the reason that Hirschfeld fought this paragraph with the government on innumerous occasions. I met Magnus Herfeld through a friend of mine who took me to the Institute for Sexual Science and introduced me first to Karl Giese, who was Magnus Herfeld's secretary, and then to Magnus Herfeld himself, who was internally at the house, generally called Papa. I met him, I found him a very sympathetic, elderly gentleman with a heavy moustache which grew over his upper lip. He looked rather like a walrus, but a very nice walrus. And he started to ask me questions about my life because his uh, medical and psychological interests lay in the variations of human nature, physically and psychologically. So I started to talk to him quite freely. As he had such a delightful charisma, I didn't feel handicapped at all. And uh, that was what interested Hirschfeld enormously, because it proved his theory that psychological and also physical inclinations are not acquired but inborn in various peoples all over the world, millions of peoples. They're all different. I think in this time, the, these social and sexual experiments may, made were open. I think in Germany and in other countries, they all human beings always did this kind of experiments. But in this time, it was openly. And it was just like a fashion for women having some lesbian experience, yeah, or for men having some homosexual experience, like Isherwood wrote in his novels. Uh, but this was not the only thing. Couples had uh, experience with other couples, or uh, they tried a free marriage, and they were talking about marriages and being always together, or being only a short time in the life together. Hannelore trägt ein Smokingkleid und einen bindenden Schlips. Trägt ein Monokel jederzeit am Band von Seidenrips. Sie boxt, sie foxt, sie golft, sie steppt und unter uns hier sah, sie neppt, besonders so im Mai. Es hat mir einer anvertraut, sie hatten Bräutjam und ne Braut, doch dies bloß nebenbei. Hannelore, Hannelore, schönstes Kind vom Halschentor. Süßes reizendes Geschöpfchen mit dem schönsten Bubiköpfchen, keiner unterscheiden kann, ob du Weib bist oder Mann. Hannelore, Hannelore, schönstes Kind vom Halschentor. Uh, in this time, I may, uh, mainly know about Berlin. In this time, we had about 50 bars for women. Now we have about five or six, so you can compare. But uh, there were also a lot of bars for men or for transvestites, and so it was, an, it was fluently, and also men came in the lesbian bars. Mali und Igel äh, sind besonders bekannt gewesen als ein Lokal, mh, wo in erster Linie die 
äh, Künstlerin und äh, Schauspielerin und äh, alles, was so äh, in der Vergnügungsbranche beschäftigt war, die gingen dahin. War, es war ziemlich teuer da, aber es war ganz entzückend. Und äh, im Allgemeinen, äh, wenn um acht aufgemacht wurde, dann kamen schon die Freundinnen und setzten sich an einen Tisch, damit der, Tisch frei, der Platz frei blieb. Und äh, nachher so um elf herum, dann kamen die so langsam von ihrem Beruf und dann haben sie bis die ganze Nacht durchgefeiert, Sonnabend, Sonntag. Das war äh, allgemein bekannt und, und äh, man war sehr gerne dort. Mali war eine ganz entzückende Frau, also wenn die, die brauchte bloß da zu stehen und kamen welche, dann fielen die ihr schon um den Hals. Also die, die wurde ihre Verehrerin überhaupt nicht los. Ja. I left Berlin in 1933, shortly after the Reichstagsfire and after the boycott of the Jewish shops, where in front of every Jewish shop was an Amen on guard to prevent anybody to do any shopping in this shop. And it was then that I decided it was time for me to leave Berlin. I met a boy of my age one, two years later, and he was very blonde and had a hair dyed, what was very extravagant and uh, 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 showing in this time. And he, I never had an affair with him, maybe be, because he was so exotic. <laughs> and, uh, but he came home and we danced wildly around the room with a Duke Ellington record and so on. And one day, this boy one day brought an idea in the head of my mother and she came in my room and just when he was off, of course, are you homosexual? And I as directly said yes. And then she left, came back after a minute, had a little bit tears in their eyes or something, and then she told me that uh, I and my second husband, we went to bars like this, and we met quite some people, and they were all very nice. But now is we have Hitler, it's prohibited, will be punished, and is very dangerous. Please don't go into bars, don't uh, uh, look around on streets, find a nice friend, and come home with him and introduce him, so she said. 
What is so remarkable about uh, Nazism is that on the one side uh, it tried to promote the family and support the family, but you could say on the other side it destroyed the family because it took uh, men and boys out of the family into their all-male organization. So what you see that next to the family, they also glorify male bonding, they glorify male comradeship. They say that a strong emotional bonds between men, like in Greece, like Greek warriors was also these friendships. For the Nazis, these uh, friendships are very important to promote the cohesion of their militaristic organizations. Now this glorification of friendship within the Nazi movement raised some serious problems for the Nazis themselves because close friendships uh, between men like they advocated could also be associated with homosexuality and was associated with homosexuality in the beginning of the 20th century a lot of times. This, this Nazi ideology on races, there was, was one uh, attempt to, to explain homosexuality as an uh, effect of the mixture of races. And they said when, when, we, when our policy of separation of races and of distinction of the Jewish race will be successful, then sexual perversions like homosexuality will uh, vanish completely. As all oppressors, the Nazis connected political meaning and sexuality. Like all uh, they said, uh, they were talking about that the political enemy has wrong sexuality. So the Jewish uh, people had a very strong sexuality, the gay people had a very strong sexuality, and in this context, also, the lesbians had a strong sexuality. We have some documents from a spy, from a Nazi spy, and he reported that lesbians uh, who were communists made sexual orgies. They had a kind of festival of orgies, yeah. Als uh, Hitler die Regierung übernommen hatte, da wusste ich, dass ich damit rechnen musste, verhaftet zu werden, in Schutz zu kommen. Und äh, sagte gleich meiner Freundin, also ich ziehe aus, äh, damit du nicht äh, belästigt wirst von der Polizei, denn du bist äh, nicht wichtig für sie und äh, kannst dann bei der Arbeit bleiben. Ich wurde am 6. April 1933 äh, verhaftet. Äh, weil ich kommunistische Stadtverordnete war. Und, aber die ganze Frauen, die, die waren links gerichtet. Also wenn sie auch nicht Kommunisten waren, waren sie vielleicht Sozialdemokraten oder etwas Ähnliches. Aber jedenfalls die ganze weibliche äh, homosexuellen Bewegung, überhaupt männliche und weibliche, die war links, sehr links. Ja. The Institute of Sexual Science was, after the Nazis came into power and Hirschfeld had been away on the world tour, luckily, uh, became less and less populated by the people who worked there. So eventually, the Institute was empty and was ravaged by the Nazis and the archives, which were most precious possessions of Magnus Herschel personally, but also of international interest with regards to uh, sexual science. That all was robbed by the Nazis, either burned or thrown away. The lesbians behave badly in the eyes of the Nazis. 
I think the mainly crime of them they were they were independent and they were not connected to one man or not so much devoted to the Führer. And the lesbians had learned in the subculture smoking cigarettes, smoking cigarettes in public and drinking alcohol. There were some writers who demanded that lesbians should be criminalized, but lesbians could be controlled as women. It was very easy for a lesbian community being antisocial. The lesbians are not married. They didn't want to present the Führer, a baby, and not waving to the uh, leader was asocial. The term asocial, we call it asocial, was a very clear term. It was just uh, a crime being this, and it was a reason to getting to concentration camp. In the beginning of the 30s, you had this famous scandal about Anne Ström, who was the leader of the SA, which until then was the most important and the most powerful group in the Nazi movement, in fact. He was killed on the order of Hitler and Himmler also, uh, for political reasons, because there were several factions in the Nazi movement. But it was very easy also for Hitler and Himmler, because Ernst Röhm was a well-known homosexual. And within the SA, a lot of leaders were homosexuals also. So they could uh, put the blame on the homosexuality of Rome and put away the political reasons. So while before the killing of Rome, the Nazis didn't take uh, severe measures against homosexuals, after that, the real persecution began, in fact. Among the Nazi doctors, there was a, a, a big discussion and uh, competition on the, the different theories and explanations of homosexuality, and no one of them was successful in turning homosexual men around in heterosexuals. And one consequence was that, that the Nazi politicians said we cannot be helped by our doctors, and we make our own policy against homosexuals, and this means we have to kill them in concentration camps when they cannot be turned around. And so the, the influence of psychotherapy was not very great in, in the Nazi period. Normally, people who were gay were put to concentration camps. There were some Nazi doctors who, who believed that homosexuality has something to do with hormones. The theory was very underdeveloped, and they made experiments in the concentration camps with gays uh, to find out how the hormones produce homosexual behavior. But uh, they were not, not successful in this. I must say my parents have been divorced since 31 and my father became an engaged uh, Nazi and he had good connections to the SS who was running the concentration camp. So I said to my mother, no, I have only one week and I don't want to sp spend the time with my father. And so she said, please go. And now she told me Henri Georg is in a concentration camp and she p spoke to my father and he said, maybe he can arrange that I can visit Henri Georg. And so I went to Oranienburg Sachsenhausen and entered the concentration camp. Work makes free, Arbeit macht frei. And, but I was not allowed to see my uncle, but I was allowed to, uh, uh, to speak to my uncle, but I was allowed to see him. And at six o'clock in the evening, the big door opened and uh, uh, the prisoners came 
in long, long, long rows back to the camp after the work, and they all wear striped clothes and they were shaved. Uh, uh, and uh, the uh, witness of Jehovah, they were violet triangles. Uh, and so I looked, if I can see Uncle George, but I didn't recognize him. They all saw the same. But then came uh, 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 the uh, people with a, a, a pink triangle, the homosexuals. And also in long rows shaved and so on. And that was a, a, a real shock. But I was staying there and I only thought, uh, uh, thinking of my father and the SS guardsmen, I said, you assholes, you never will see me here marching in rows. That was what I promised to myself. To myself. The uh, lesbian saw that their uh, gay friends, or the, the male homosexual, was from their cliques or something from their surroundings, were brought uh, to police stations, were brought uh, to prison, or brought uh, even to concentration camps. And I think this affected the life of the lesbians very much, maybe much more than laws or certain rules. Uh, um, because this, uh, from this grew so many fear out of it. They saw that a man was in, in a bar, in a gay bar, and were arrested, uh, and they were full of fear that this might happen next day or next year to them. And they also um, saw that a gay man asked them for marriage because they were arrested, and I have some examples, and then they told the police, I am not a gay or a homosexual man, I am a normal man, I am engaged with the women. And then they went out of the police station, ran to a lesbian and said, please marry me, because I, am, I told them I am engaged with you. And so I think most of the fear and most of the, that the subculture got destroyed is coming from this. I think not so much that there are laws, that the newspaper were forbidden, that the publisher houses were destroyed. I think seeing that some went to prison or some went to concentration camps and what happened to them, uh, that uh, created the most fear. Da ist mir einmal eine eigenartige Sache passiert. Und da ging ich äh, in Schöneberg äh, die Spichernstraße entlang. Und äh, an der Ecke äh, von der Nachbarstraße, da stand eine Dame. Und die war mir irgendwie so gut so bekannt, aber ich wusste nicht, wer sie war. Äh, schlank, groß, eine, eine schöne Jüdin. Und... Äh, die spricht mich auch an, also muss sie mich auch gekannt haben, aber ich habe keine, keine Ahnung gehabt, wer es war. Und äh, spricht mich an und sagt, soll ich fahren oder soll ich nicht fahren? Ich sage aber ja, fahren. Ja, die sagen alle, das gibt sich wieder. Da äh, kommt denn nichts mehr nach gegen uns. Und da sage ich, das ist Unsinn, sie müssen so schnell wie möglich wegfahren aus Deutschland. Und dann sagt sie, ja, heute Nachmittag geht ein Zug. Ich sage, nehmen Sie den Zug. Sagt sie, ja. Und geht. Und weg war sie. Und dann nachher, dann fiel mir erst ein, das muss Mali von Mali und Igel gewesen sein. Äh, denn ich kannte sie, aber ich konnte sie im Moment nicht unterbringen, weil das schon in der Nazizeit sogar eine paar Monate später war, also da wusste ich das nicht so, äh, wo sie war und so. I was heavily wounded in Russia in 1941. In 1943, I was in an office, army office at Berlin working. And um, here I met a boy, and this boy had a, from Russia vacation, and he lived with uh, friends I know. And but this boy, was very effeminated and it was very obvious. And uh, he delayed coming back to the front uh, about six, seven days. 
and the, uh, the military pos uh, 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 police wrapped him at Station Charlottenburg and uh, he came in a prison at Brandenburg and as his mother later told to those friends of him, uh, uh, they gave him an injection of being insane and not worth to life. That was uh, one case. And then at Berlin also, 43, 44 maybe, there have been two soldiers of the SS. They were here for a course of intelligence service and they had a private room at Wielandstraße in the, in the apartment of a widow. And I visit them sometimes, and this widow was very nice, uh, was playing the mother of the boys and even playing a little bit the mother of gays. But one day she observed act, uh, activities of those two boys. They announced it to the SS. The SS came, uh, uh, arrested them, and they both were shot. And uh, I really wondered, uh, what uh, this woman m may have moved to do this. And I, uh, it's, uh, several, uh, to, up to the end of the war even, I made a circle around that block at Wilhelmstraße not to uh, step into her and be maybe recognized. So that was another story of this kind, yeah. There were many lesbians in concentration camp, but we have no evidence that lesbians as lesbians were put in concentration camp because a female homosexuality was not forbidden by law. But the Nazis found many ways to put a lesbian women in concentration camps. They put them under the sign of a, a social or and, and under the signs they said they are prostitutes and were put in concentration camps, or they were communists or Jewish women. So they found many ways, or they were bad to the German community, then they also were sent to concentration camps. Alle Konzentrationsläger hatten ein Bordell. Und äh, da kamen nicht nur die Prostituierten hin, äh, sondern auch äh, aus irgendwelchen Gründen unbeliebte äh, homosexuelle Frauen, äh, die, äh, von denen man das auf irgendeine Weise herausbekommen hatte. Oder äh, wenn zum Beispiel ein, ein Mann auf eine äh, Frau eine Absicht hatte und die hatte eine Freundin, Und äh, er konnte feststellen, dass sich das eben um lesbische Frage handelte. Da hat er sie einfach angezeigt, aber meistens nicht angezeigt äh, wegen deswegen, sondern sie hat auf Hitler geschimpft oder irgendetwas. Also der Grund ist meistens ein anderer gewesen. Äh, darum kann man auch die lesbischen Frauen nicht herausfinden, denn sie hatten ja keinen rosa Winkel wie die Männer, sondern sie hatten meistens schwarze Winkel. Also äh, na, Kriminelle. Und da kam dann alles runter, wo man nicht wusste, was es war oder was. Und da kamen auch die homosexuellen Frauen darunter. Und da man ja auch äh, unter den Prostituierten eine Menge homosexueller Frauen hatte, da war das, naja, das war dann ein Aufwaschen. Ich war, die kamen alle zusammen eben ins Bordell und dann war die Sache erledigt. Ja. As I told you before, I lived with my father and I came home one night and my stepmother told me that the Gestapo had called. And as I was out, they said, fine, we'll come back tomorrow morning, which indeed they did. And there was a house search in my room, and in my writing desk, they found an address book, which they took with them, and then I was taken to the Gestapo headquarters, where I was interrogated by these Gestapo men in a way which I would, in hindsight, say was 
perfectly correct and acceptable. But when the interrogation at the Gestapo was over, I was taken to a police prison, where I found myself together with two other chaps in the cell. And during the first night there, I was taken into a room in the cellar where there were, I would say, I'm not certain about the actual number, but I would say about 10 men, and each of them held a stick very much heavier than my walking stick. And they had my address book in their hands, this one after the other. I have to stand to attention in front of each one, had to undress, and then they opened my address book and said, who is this man? So I said, I'm very sorry, I can't tell you. And this interrogation went on from man to man, accompanied each time by a desperate blow with that heavy stick. Now, eventually, and there is a blank now in my mind, I came to on the floor of the cell, which you may know, may not know, is never in complete darkness during the night. There's always a little lamp hanging down, so there is a sort of semi-light. When I came to, I th thought, how extraordinary. Somebody must have poured honey over my face. And I did this and looked at my hand and realized that it was covered in blood. So, of course, my first reaction when I got over the immediate shock uh, was that my face had been bashed in. And I thought, what's going to happen to my future? I can't work in the theater with a monstrously disfigured face. So time went by, not many weeks, until I was called out of my cell and taken to the ground floor where this same gentleman who interrogated me waited for me and said, I have good news for you. You are free. But don't run away. Wait for official information by letter that the case against you, because of lack of evidence, is closed. And that, I'm afraid, is the end of my story and the fact that I'm still sitting here talking to you. <laughs>